Welcome to Worship with Midland Online this week. I'm glad you're able to join us as we take opportunity to gather together wherever we happen to be at this time for a time of worship. Um, hopefully an opportunity to experience God, uh, to be reminded that God is with us in our lives wherever we're at, whatever's going on, uh, that at no point does God leave us um, or just put it up to us to figure life out on our own, that God is with us all the time working in us and through us. And that's great reason to get together over and over again and remind ourselves. And so I hope you're doing well. Uh, a couple of things make sure you're aware of happening here um, at Midland. And we have got great opportunity coming up for kids throughout our community for get Vacation Bible School. It is on July 26th through the 30th. So go on and get your kids, your grandkids, your friends that are nearby that need to be there signed up now. Uh, spaces are limited as we are only so big as a church. And so go on and grab your spot for Vacation Bible School July 26th through the 30th. A lot of fun uh, for that week for uh, the kids here in our community. And if you want to volunteer and be a part of it, let us know. Go on there now. Uh, fill out the form to be a volunteer with us. One of the things we do is we do background checks on all of our volunteers here at Midland. And so um, this matters, but we got to have time to get that thing done. So if you haven't had that done yet, make sure you get your name in so we can get a background check um, run as well. Because we're looking to create a safe and awesome experience uh, for kids and families throughout our community here on July 26th through the 30th. Uh, this week, just to let you know, kind of we're going to have a time where I'm going to uh, go on and look at a parable, uh, one that you've probably heard before, and I don't know what it's done to you, but I'm going to share a little bit of my experience with this one parable. Um, we're going to have a, a song here this morning where you get a chance to sing along or maybe uh, just sit back and listen, and we're going to have a time of prayer together. And so, you know, as we come into this time, just a reminder that you can uh, text to give at 706 uh, 222 1014, or you can go to our website, click on the link to give there at the top and give online, or mail in your checks to P.O. Box 118, uh, Midland, Georgia 31820. That's kind of what makes possible a lot of the stuff that we do around here is the generosity of folks like you. So thank you for supporting the ministries here at Midland. Take that time here this week as well um, to continue on and enjoy this time as we worship together here this week. <laughs>
God, as you move and act uh, in this world all around us, as you remind us that you're always with us and that we're never alone, as we find reason to live life and keep taking step after step, waking up day after day, facing our future unafraid. It's not because we finally figured it out and know it and got it right, but it's because you are God and you've chosen to love us and you have chosen to do amazing work in our lives and in this world all around us, even in the midst of the brokenness and the pain that we have experienced. And so here this week, God, we bring before you all the prayer requests, those that are sitting on our hearts now, but God, we're not talking about them with everyone, but we bring them before you, asking you to be at work in these places and to and make sure that we're aware, God, that you are at work. And may we as your people respond throughout our community as we meet people who are in need. And may we be your hands and feet throughout this community. We bring before you uh, the prayer request, God, for those who are sick, those who are facing situations they never thought were coming their way and now have arrived. God, for those who feel alone and lonely during this time, and we ask that you so fill them with your spirit and your presence with them, that they have reason to believe and to live life each day. It's now as your people that we join together in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If there's a parable out there that I can remember from so early on in my life, it's the one I want to look at this week. It's the parable that was uh, taught several times uh, throughout my childhood. One time that I really, really well remember at a revival taking place right here at this church at Midland United Methodist Church when I was a kid. Yep, that's right. I grew up here. Uh, my family's been a part of this church since like, I don't know, early 1900s or something like that. But I remember this revival taking place when I was a kid and we had a guest preacher coming in, of course, uh, to preach for this revival. And uh, one night he began to preach on this parable that we read here. And it went something like this. Many people think they are Christians, but they're not. They might look like one on the outside, but they are empty on the inside. And as he's saying these words, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is me. And I'm not sure if you can look back on your life, if you grew up in the church, heard church stuff, but um, some of us have gone through that period where we were trying to figure out how to get saved and get saved for real. And I was definitely having those moments at this point in my life. And as he is saying this, I'm going, that is me. And he goes, there's the wheat and the chafe is the way story kind of read back in the day. And he said, you know, the wheat is the real deal. The chafe looks like it, but they're empty on the inside. And I'm looking around and everybody else in the room is kind of sitting there like, yep, whatever. And I am like on the inside losing it. I'm going, that's me. I'm such a faker. I, I look like it, but I'm not. I'm a good kid. I don't get in trouble very much for the inside. I don't really believe. I'm not really a follower of Jesus and I am losing it. Have y'all ever been there before and experienced this? And I tell this story probably about, I don't know, once a year at least. You know, if you've been around me, you've heard this story before. But here's the crazy thing. As I look back on that story in that time when this is being preached, and it hit me so hard that I wasn't really a Christian, even though I thought I was at one point, either I'd prayed the prayer a number of times, um, and that I still wasn't for real. Um, as I looked back on those moments and this parable right here, I went through all of my records of my sermons that I have available right now, at least, which goes back many years of preaching, um, and I have never preached a sermon on this parable. I have, as I said, referenced it probably once a year, this experience that was uh, something that has stuck with me for a long time. Uh, I have never preached on it uh, that I can find anywhere. And so as I was going through, I was thinking, wow, you know, I really was scared to death of this parable. So here's the deal. I'm going to take it on this week and see how I do. So feel free to say, Stefan, you have lost your mind and uh, this parable has influenced you and you can't come in. You've got too much baggage with it. That's fair game, but let's be honest real quick. We all got baggage. Every preacher out there and every person out there has got baggage. We bring it to every conversation we have. Fair enough. So I'm making you aware of my baggage I'm bringing this week uh, as I talk about this parable. But I want to look at this because the part that really gets me that stands out is this idea of the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Are you familiar with that phrase at all? The, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. You will be cast out in into the darkness where there is, as we're going to talk about a little bit today, um, this idea of a blazing furnace where there's weeping and gnashing of 
teeth. Yeah, it only shows up in the Gospel of Matthew. Had no idea. I really thought it was in you know most of the Synoptic Gospels, um, but it's only in Matthew. It shows up only six times in the Gospel of Matthew. Three times it refers to darkness. Uh, so there, you'll be in this darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Two times it refers uh, to this idea of a blazing furnace. And one time, it just refers to where the hypocrites are. And so there you go. This idea of the weeping and gnashing of teeth is darkness. It is where there is a blazing fire. And it is also where the hypocrites are. And so you have all this idea, which, by the way, kind of crazy to think about. But you can't have a blazing fire in darkness. Have you ever been around a fire? Fires are pretty bright. So kind of shifts a little bit of what's really going on with these. Because a lot of times people like to say, yeah, those parables are talking about how those kind of people are going to end up in that kind of place. And you know that kind of place is the H-E double high hockey sticks, right? But I kind of begin to wonder if that's really what's going on here, because one of the things that's really interesting to me um, that I've heard many people talk about as they look at the scripture and where we are now, and as we read, and they say, you know, the crazy thing is when the Bible was being written, uh, they were asking questions that many of us are not really asking right now, and that nowadays we are asking questions that a lot of times the people of that time weren't even considering to ask. And so as we look at that and think about it, that means sometimes we got to be kind of careful as we're reading through these stories as to where we end up. And that's something I want to talk about a little bit today as we read through this parable of the wheat and the weeds and see if we can in some way find out what does this mean and how does it teach me something as we've been talking about throughout this series about the new world and the new values of the kingdom of God that I'm a part of. How does this story in some way teach me something about the new world and the new values of the kingdom of God that I'm a part of? And here's how the story goes. If you've never heard this one, it's going to be fun if you've heard this one. Bring all that you've got from the times you've heard it, how you understand it, to the table as we read it together this week. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 starts like this. Now, in Matthew, Matthew 13 here, Jesus is out. He is already angered uh, the religious leaders of the time. The Pharisees are after him. Uh, in fact, he tells a parable right before this that was a parable we read two weeks ago from the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of Mark, and it was uh, the soils, you know, the, the rocky and the thorny and that kind of thing. And he's just told that story in the Gospel of Matthew. And after he tells that story, you have the Pharisees very upset. And it says actually at one point or another that they've already plotted to kill him. So the Pharisees are already out to kill him. Jesus is telling parables. He seems to not really care they've plotted to kill him because he's not stopping and backing down. And he begins to tell this parable in chapter 13, verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. So this is the man who sowed, who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. And so here's this idea, if you've ever heard this before, that there is a certain type of weed that looks a lot like wheat. And as they grow, they look very similar. Um, it's just when you really, as you've maybe heard from our reference earlier, crack them open, you see one's empty on the inside. But they begin to change the way they look as they get a little bit older. But they're very similar, especially in the early stages. All right. So you got this planting of this man has planted his garden and it's out there. It's looking good. But someone has snuck in and put in all kinds of weeds in there. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then weeds also appeared. And here come questions, two questions that the servants are going to ask of here the owner. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? And here's the question. Where then did the weeds come from? Sir, I mean, we, we saw how this was going down. You only put out the good seed in your field. How in the world did weeds end up in here? And here's... How the owner responds. An enemy did this, he replied. And who is this enemy? Right? An enemy did this. And who's the enemy? Jesus, by the way, during this time, um, there's a lot going on with the Roman government and there's a lot going on with the Jewish people, but Jesus seems to be speaking to something even bigger than just a Roman government or Jewish people. Jesus is going to seem to begin to address something more, this idea of evil, as we would probably think of that, that has come into the world. And it's kind of interesting about this idea of evil because we usually associate this idea of 
of evil and the bad stuff, you know, and then this eternal punishment idea kind of with what God has created to be the way it goes for the evil stuff. But it's really interesting in the beginning. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. And if you read through the Psalms and you read through so many places in Scripture, at no point does it talk about God creating another place. It just says God created heaven and earth, the creator of, the maker of heaven and earth, which is kind of interesting to have in your mind as we read this story now, as an enemy has showed up. An enemy did this, he replied, and as the servants hear the owner say, you know, an enemy did this, which isn't very specific yet. Don't worry, Jesus is going to explain this parable, which is great. Um, he just says, an enemy did this, and the servants are like, okay, uh, well, what does this mean? And here comes their second question. The servants then ask, do you want us to go and pull them up? Okay, so I got you. Here's what happened. We went out and we got all of our wheat planted out there. And then at some point, as you're saying, the enemy came, planted uh, these weeds, and we didn't recognize it until now. But now we see we've got a really big problem here with the weeds and the wheat growing up all over our weeds. Have you ever planted a garden? I mentioned a couple weeks ago that uh, back in uh, last year, right around this time, we were kind of harvesting in uh, one of the first gardens we'd had in years. My family grew up planting a garden. My grandfather was a very big uh, farmer here uh, in Columbus, biggest one in Muskogee County. That's right. Um, And we would do this all summer long. It's something I did as a kid growing up. Haven't done it forever. We did it last year, the first time in a long time. Um, And you remember, if you were in for uh, that week's uh, message, we had all kinds of weeds that ended up coming up as well. So I kind of get this idea that the weeds come up and they can be a real problem and you wish they weren't there. But hear how the owner of this land responds when he is asked, do you want us to go and pull up these weeds? No, he answered. And here comes this big point, right? No, 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 no. I don't want you to pull up the weeds. And why don't you want us to pull up the weeds? Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. You're not exactly qualified for this job. It's not what you're here for. I I, I don't have you hired here as my servants to be the ones to pull out the weed around the wheat. No, no, that's not your role. If you try to do that, there's a very good chance you're going to end up pulling out the wheat with it. Because, by the way, they look alike and they're growing together. And if you've ever been there before and you've tried to pull something out, you can pull up more than just that one thing you've grabbed. Yep, did that last year in our garden, right? He says, no, 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 leave it alone. You may uproot the wheat with them. In other words, you're not qualified for this job. And in order to try to remove the bad part, you may ruin the good part. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, not, not you servants, but the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. In other words, get rid of that bad stuff. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And so here's the deal. You farmers, my servants, you're not deemed capable of doing this, but we'll have the harvesters coming in at that time, and they know what they're doing. They'll be the ones who will separate it out. They'll get rid of the weed and burn it, and then we'll take this wheat and put it into my barn. I want to skip ahead. Jesus tells two more parables right there, and then he gets alone with his disciples. We pick it up in verse 36. Then he left the crowd, and he went into the house, His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field, which I love that they're very comfortable now asking questions of Jesus. Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered. Now, as Jesus answers this, be careful kind of what we begin to draw out of it, because a lot of times we can really begin to, we call it eisegesis instead of exegesis, not what do we pull from a text, but what do we insert into a text? Yep. Be careful you don't insert things into the text as we read here, because he's very plain. He says, Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. We also refer to that as the Son of God later on. That would be Jesus, right? So the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field, the field out there is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The good people, I mean, the good seed is the people of the kingdom sown The good seed by the Son of Man. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. Diablos. That's right. Diablos right there is the word that kind of comes in here. Um, And so here now the devil idea is showing up for us. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters 
are angels. Now, do you get this kind of scenario as it's laid out? He says, Son of God. He says, hey, that's kind of like the Son of Man, kind of like Jesus goes out, and he's the one that went out, and he sowed uh, the seed to plant this wheat, and he planted it out there, and the field is like the kingdom of God, and these good things, I mean, it's like the world, the field is like the world, and the good seed is like the people of the kingdom of God, and the weeds are like the people that are evil, and by the way, the evil one is the devil, and the ones to harvest at the end of the age are the angels, not, not the people, but, you know, God's servants there. Verse 40, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. So now we need to know about this weeds and being burned in a fire because immediately what do we go to? That's right. We, we immediately go to burning in. That's right. A very hot place. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. So when the harvesters come in, they will weed out, pull out all that causes sin and do what? Evil. Why? Here's why. This is the big one to kind of like put it down for as we read through this and what I think Jesus is really getting at here. As he says, everything that causes sin and do evil will be pulled out. Those are the weeds because evil has no place in the kingdom of God. Because evil has no place in the kingdom of God. And if you have chosen to continue to be a part of evil, then you will be pulled with this, maybe. Maybe. Keep going. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, which I told you, this is interesting. This is a blazing furnace. It sounds a lot like Daniel. If you've read the Old Testament here, you heard a story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a blazing furnace, Right? And they will be thrown into a blazing furnace where there will be, in the future tense here, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, sadness, anger, resentment, constant conflict. Which sounds a lot like the very thing that happens in the midst of evil, does it not? Evil can be resigned to itself. And taken to this place where itself produced the very thing evil produces. The weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And as I begin to read this, it finishes up verse 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. It begins to sound a little bit like there's this idea that at some point evil will be pulled out. And it will no longer be a part of what life is here in this world because the kingdom of God that we have eagerly awaited that we oftentimes refer to as heaven will be back here again. And the question that we ask each week, how does this teach me something about the new world and the new values of the kingdom of God that I am a part of? Here's the big deal. When we begin to talk about, not about what does this say about my life, because usually this gets preached and goes, you know what, which one are you? Which is how I remember it as a kid is, are you wheat or are you weed? Which one are you? Are you wheat or are you weed? You might think you're wheat, but you're probably a weed, right? And you're like, oh no, I got to change my life. And this is this internal thing of I got to look at me and I got to fix me. And yet Jesus is talking to this group of people. And as he's speaking to them, he seems to be talking to them like they are the servants. They are the ones that are with him. And his big deal is not, are you sure you're not weed? Which is how it usually gets preached, but it was what more about? It was about how you as someone who is part of the kingdom of God, is to handle the weeds. And this is a big shift, which is completely different than me saying, you need to figure out if you are wheat or weeds. Because if you want to know the truth, that's kind of a problem. Because I'm not sure if you've ever seen it happen, but I've never seen it happen where the wheat became the weeds, or even better, where weeds became wheat. Right? Right? All stories, all illustrations will break down at some point. And if that's what you try to grab from this, you are in big trouble because I have never seen it happen where someone could be a weed. I mean, where a weed could be growing. And at some point I said, never mind, that is no longer a weed because it's been in my garden long enough. That weed has now become the very crop I was hoping for. Doesn't happen, does it? 
And so either we're stuck going, you are stuck with who you are and you will never change and eliminate the transforming power of who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God. Or we have to be willing to say, this parable is going to break down at some point, and maybe the big point is not, are you weed that be, needs to become wheat? But it is this, as a servant of the Son of God, what are we supposed to be about? You see, the kingdom of God has no place for evil and intent to harm others. How does this teach me something about the new world and the new values of the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God has no place for evil and intent to harm others. Jesus came to show this, that he refused to overtake the world by violence and force and power. Instead, he came to make great love known through life laid down. And our job now is to join the work. And it's not to get the weeds out, but to be wheat. You see, it is so easy to judge, but it is so hard to know the truth about a person. Fair? It is so easy to judge someone and talk about all that they've got wrong and all they need to fix and who they really are. And yet it is so hard to really know the truth about a person. Have you ever found yourself and you're going, I guess I was just making a lot of assumptions about you. You're not who I thought you were. Fair? It's hard to tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. That's what this story is really all about, is it not? That they can't tell till really late in the game what is what. And by that point, there's none of this sorting out. And so this idea is hard to tell the difference between the weeds and the wheat. The servants must be the ones who are willing to help the farmer and to do whatever it is, is their role. And uprooting the imposters is not going to solve the problem because they probably, one, lack an ability to really know the difference between them until so late in the game. And by so late in the game, when we can finally tell for sure what the difference is to uproot would be to uproot it all. And we've seen this happen over and over again within the course of what the church has done in the past in the name of Jesus. We call them the Crusades, where thousands and hundreds of thousands were just massacred. In the name of, that's the version of weeding out the field. It's the abortion clinics getting bombed and people shot in the name of, right? It's the movement that we think is in some way relieving the problems and yet in the very act of it only making things worse. And as Jesus is talking to them at this time, and the Jewish people have some resentment already growing in the leaders of the Jewish folks with the Pharisees at this time, have already plotted to kill him. And he says, our goal is not to try to wipe them out before they get to us, but to let things all grow up together. Many have been killed in the name of Jesus in the act of weeding out. And someone once said, I thought was great, we maximize the flaws of others while minimizing our own. This idea of the very other thing that showed up, darkness, a fiery furnace, and hypocrites. And we become the very hypocrites on accident and do no good for the kingdom of God. Our effort to get rid of sin in the lives of others does more harm than good most of the time. You see, the kingdom of God has no place for evil and intent to harm others. For us to join the work, it's not about to get the weeds out, but to be the wheat that yields more wheat. Not you to think about you are wheat, but not, but to think that they are weeds. Well, maybe they're not. And there's a shift. And that's a different way to read this story. And that's where I want to kind of wrap it up this week. I don't think this is a story trying to say, you know what, you think you are, but you're not. I think this is a story that's trying to tell you it's not your role to figure it out for others. 
but let us be a people who live in such a way where we become a wheat that yields wheat and allow the harvesters to do their job and allow the farmer, the son of God, to do the great work of planting the seed. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for the work that you do in our lives. This call now to respond. It's in no way, God, to, to offer up the judgment and condemnation to separate out and to clean up your field for you, but to serve you, to be the wheat in the field, the good crop that you have planted that can yield more good crop as you work and tend to the soil. God, that's our goal. That's what we want to be about. God, work in our hearts for us to see this world the way you do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and communion with the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We'll see you next week.